The Ducks have their eyes on a lot of big-time recruits in the class of 2023. One name that Oregon fans are looking at in a major way is Dante Moore. What would his commitment to the Ducks, which hopefully will happen, what would that actually mean for Oregon as it pertains to the recruiting trail and the roster? Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster and lifelong Oregon Ducks fan. Thanks for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. Like, comment, subscribe wherever you are listening to or watching this show. Thanks to all of you out there who have helped me reach over 500 subscriptions on the YouTube channel and hundreds more on podcasts as well. I see all of you. I hear from a lot of you, and I absolutely Absolutely love doing that. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all of that. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. And we are starting the show today with a mailbag question that comes via the YouTube comments. One of the four ways you can get a question answered here on the show. You can tweet with the hashtag AskLODPod, or you can DM me at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks in addition to just hopping into the YouTube comments, which I monitor daily. Different parts of the day, right? Maybe you drop a comment on there early in the morning. I might not see it till later at night if it's a day like today where I was literally at the golf course for eight hours today. I got there. It was at the range for about an hour and a half, then went and played and then at another hour and a half range session afterwards because I'm trying to fix something in my swing at this point in time. So that's the reason that I don't get back to people for uh, long stretches of time. It's really the only time that I'm uh, unavailable. But other than that, I will get back to you. And this one came in via the YouTube comments uh, by someone whose username is commented. I think that's pretty good. Then it might read as commented, commented. That's all right, points. Uh, He asks, what would a Dante Moore commitment mean for this recruiting class. I think there would be several positive ramifications. There's literally no downside, right? It's all upside. Not getting him would be a little bit of a disappointment at, at this point when you consider that Oregon very nearly had Nico and then he goes to Tennessee and Jaden Rashada has chosen Miami and Avery Johnson looks like he's trending towards Kansas State. So the Ducks, after not getting a high school quarterback in the class of 2022, which it is not uh, a huge knock on uh, on the program right now because you, you had the coaching change in there. So I think that's a little bit more challenging. You know, typically a quarterback commitment is going to to need the full run through of a recruiting cycle. But I, I think there's an expectation right now and a reasonable one amongst Duck fans that Oregon's going to be able to land big time players, and that includes a big time quarterback like Adante Moore, who would be. Uh, if he committed the highest rated quarterback recruit in Oregon history. Yes, even higher than Ty Thompson, who's a little bit bigger, might have a little bit bigger arm. But I think Dante Moore right now, from what I've seen from the two of them, both on TV and in person, I think Dante Moore is a little bit more refined uh, at this point in time. So he's definitely a guy who would be able to come in and compete for the starting job right away. But you don't know what Oregon's quarterback room is going to look like in 2023. Is Bo Nix still going to be there? Would Ty or Jay transfer out? You just, you, you don't know, but he would be the highest rated quarterback commit in, uh, in Oregon history right now. Oregon's recruiting class is number 26th nationally, which is just where they stand at this point in the cycle. And remember we are talking about recruits in the class of 2023 that elevated the, the national recruiting rankings for, for the Ducks recruiting class this year, all the way in Connerly committed in April, April. Yeah. I I'm, I'm pretty sure it was April. And then you had um, Kyler Casper reclassify and he committed in April or May some sometime in there. So, you know, building out a full class is not a, a done deal here in the month of June. And if Oregon, after these two huge recruiting weekends, when Dante Moore was on campus, Richard Young was there, you had Mateo Uyunglele, you had Jaden Wayne, you had uh, David Hicks the weekend before. I mean, there's just a lot of big tech. Colton Vasek, four-star defensive end. 
A lot of big-time players. I talked about most of them yesterday on, on the show, all the guys who've been on campus. If you don't get all of them, it's important to remember all the ones you want, I should say. You're, of course, not going to get all of them. But if you don't get all the ones you want, or at least a good number of the players that, that you're hoping for, it's important to remember that this is not when recruiting ends. Now, it, it's a dead period I believe from now until about July 24th, there aren't allowed to be any visits on campus. It's just, it's an NCAA rule, I I believe. Don't quote me on that. I'm not an NCAA rules expert here, but there's a lot of names that that are out there. And Oregon's class right now is number 26 nationally. I think that going forward, we should expect that the class of 2023 and beyond will be at least top 15, if not top 10. I mean, the staff has the recruiting chops, I think, to be in the top 10, and the recruiting base and presence for for the Ducks out on the trail is pretty well established at this point. We saw a top 10 class in the 2021, which I'll be getting to in the next segment of today's show, but it would it would it would move it up. Uh, you know, in terms of a Dante Moore commitment, you'd go from number 26 to uh, certainly inside the top 20. I mean, he's a really highly rated guy. He's composite rating super high. He's a top, I think, 20 player. I think he's like number number 12. Why don't I look that up uh, right now? But, you know, g- getting a guy like that is certainly going to, uh, is certainly going to raise the 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 status of your recruiting class in terms of rankings, which, you know, is not everything, but it's certainly something that you monitor. Oh, yeah, he's he's top 10. So in the class of 2023, he is the number eight player nationally. And th- that would be obviously a, a really good get. So that would put it inside the top 20 and and put Oregon well well on their way, I think, towards uh, trending into a top 10 class in, in, in uh, the 2023 cycle. Um, the other thing that it would do in the positive sense, again, all positive news if he commits, no downsides whatsoever. It's hard to imagine that when you get a guy like that who has as much clout and uh, name recognition on the recruiting trail as he does, hard to imagine that's not going to help you bring in other big-time recruits. Now, Oregon has already been, uh, I think, above average in terms of my own expectations for, for recruiting the offensive side of the ball, both in the 2022 and 2023 cycles right now. But if you get Dante Moore... Right. And I've talked about this before on the show. They've been doing all that without a flagship quarterback recruit. And typically it gets easier to bring in other players when you have a young quarterback. Right. Because maybe, uh, it, you know, obviously this is not going to work out. But Jaden Rashad and Jerry on Dickey played on the the same seven on seven team. Guys have, you know, maybe uh, played with one another in in that sort of environment. Maybe they play against each other in high school if they're from California schools. All that sort of stuff can can tie in. And then also you just have the the, the baseline aspect of that's a big time recruit. And man, maybe I want to go play with him or like I, I know who that guy is. I want to go catch passes for him or I want to be a backfield duo with him or I want to protect that guy. There's a lot of, I, I think, positive externalities there. And, you know, not just recruiting other players, but also helping keep Oregon's commits that they have. I've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. Oregon, I think, needs to continue to recruit Jerry on Dickey. He, he is going to, I, I would guess, I, I don't have an inside track on this. This is just an estimation on my part. At some point, it would not surprise me if he got bumped up to being a, a five-star rated receiver. But if you're able to get Dante Moore, I'd feel a lot better about Oregon's chances of retaining him in the class of 2023 if he knows who he's going to be catching passes from and that it's a guy like Dante Moore who has the potential to be you know, a really good Power 5 starting quarterback. Uh, there's one person in particular who it would be massive for to get a, a commitment from Dante Moore. I'll tell you who after I tell you that BetOnline is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's NHL playoffs and Major League Baseball. Go Mariners, Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, from live betting to esports and scores, and the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. You can bet MMA, boxing, golf, whatever you want. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game Game starts. A Dante Moore commitment would be massive for Kenny Dillingham. I, I think even more so than Dan Lanning because Lanning's a defensive coach and I hope he's going to call the defensive plays. But Dillingham, I know, is going to be the offensive play caller. And, and this is the first time 
that that he's the man on offense and there's nobody else in his ear. I mean, if you're talking about the top offensive coaches on the staff, he's not a co-offensive coordinator with somebody. The head coach doesn't come from the offensive side of the ball. It's just him. And so I, I think that that is a major opportunity for him to establish his presence on the trail as a recruiter. He doesn't have a reputation as, as an elite recruiter the way that, you know, a Carlos Lachlan, Junior Adams, Tosh Lupoy, or, or Dan Lanning do at this point in time. So if you're able to go out there and get one of the 10 best players in the class 2023 and it's a quarterback and that helps you bring in more offensive skill talent in the next recruiting cycle, I think it'd be really, really big for for Kenny Dillingham to be able to to kind of be able to come in and stake his claim with regards to this is what I'm capable of. These are the sorts of players that that I can bring in, and then also you know have have the talent to be able to showcase what he's capable of as a play caller. And we'll get a great idea of that in in the upcoming 2022 season because Oregon has plenty of talent, right? Bo Nix is not an untalented quarterback, assuming he's the starter. And I mean the the running back depth is is young, but it's pretty talented, right? I mean, the dollars, a Cardwell, and then you've got Irving and Whittington as well with Jordan James. Like that's a pretty talented room. The offensive line will probably be better than any that he ha- has been with so far. I don't know how Florida state's was a season ago, but Auburn's over the years have been a little shaky in the sec, but Oregon will have one of the premier units in, in that position group in the pac 12 this season. I think that's a great thing for an offensive coordinator to have. I'm fascinated to see how he's going to run the ball. Might need to do a full full segment on what uh, you know what, what what to expect or kind of what what I want to see from him. Just just spitballing here, but um, I I think that it'd be massive for Dillingham to be able to you know kind of raise his profile a little bit. And when I talked to Dante Moore in person a couple of weeks ago, he he didn't just have nice things to say about the Ducks in Oregon, but I asked him about Dillingham and he didn't, you know, say like, Oh yeah, he's a good guy. Like I like, but, but like his face lit up as well. When you're talking to these recruits, they're never going to say anything bad uh, about a coach or about a school because all the coaches are being nice to him. All the coaches, at least you would assume. Uh, but if they, if they're in, uh, if they're in the recruitment process for a pretty big time guy like Dante Moore, the coaches are being nice to him. The coaches are, you know, uh, trying to, to sell them on, on their programs and, and the coaches are, you know, telling them that, that they're great and that they see this potential and all that sort of stuff. And so they're not going to say anything bad because that's also a bad look. If you go out there and you badmouth somebody who's trying to offer you a football scholarship and helping your development as, uh, a, a, as a player and as a person. But, you know, when I asked him about, you know, I asked him a number of different questions and his face really lit up when he talked about Dillingham. And so, if that relationship is as good as Dante, uh, you know, said that it is, maybe this commitment is going to happen, and maybe they do really vibe, and maybe that's, you know, the the guy that that he really wants. But we'll, we'll have to see. But uh, commented, thank you for the question. Keep them coming. Remember hashtag Ask LOD Pod or YouTube comments at Locked On Ducks or at Smalls underscore fifty five are the Twitter handles. You can tweet at me. You can DM me. DMs are wide open. Slide up there. Ask me a question. Get it answered here on the show. Shift to segment number two today, and that's uh, about the impact that recruiting can actually have because we talk about recruiting plenty here on the show, and and why wouldn't we, right? I mean, (laughs) it's the makeup of your roster, and the best teams have just about always recruited at, at a really high level. I know there's some people out there who think that you know, people like me who love recruiting and, and studying these guys. And why is this guy's composite rating higher than that guy's over there? And uh, what kind of player could he become? And like, there are some people out there who think like it's it's a little bit overblown. You go too much into it. But I will just always come back to the best schools and the best programs. Put a lot of money, put a lot of resources, put a lot of time into recruiting, put a lot of effort into recruiting. And they treat it with the utmost importance. And there is a reason. But, you know, a question I, I ended up asking myself that, that I'm going to answer is how impactful can a freshman class really be, right? Because some of this is projecting into the future about, you know, the sorts of players that, that recruits could become, right? I see Richard Young, five-star running back who maybe he'll commit to Oregon, maybe not. The 24-7 crystal balls right now have him going to Alabama. We'll see. I see him and I see a combination of Michael James and Royce Freeman, right? Or a, a Thomas Tyner type of back who, who's powerful but shifty and has great lateral quickness as well. And so some of it is projection about what he could become down the line. But 
The other the other factor is oftentimes you do have true freshmen in a recruiting class who can contribute right away. And, and that's not always the case depending on what sport you're talking about, but it's more true at the collegiate level than the professional where oftentimes you take a guy in, in the draft or sign him as an undrafted free agent, you know, all right, this is going to be a development. This is going to be a, a, a little bit of a process. College football, you can have a big time recruiting class like Oregon had in 2021 and have players who contribute in a significant way immediately, like in their first season. And a great example of that is the highest rated recruiting class in school history. 2021 had 23 total commits from guys coming from the high school ranks who came to Oregon as true freshmen. And uh, just about all of them are still on the roster. Kingsley is of course not. And we'll get to see him uh, sadly in, uh, in September against BYU at Autzen stadium. But I was looking at the 2021 recruiting class and thinking about like, okay, who, who are these guys actually made a big time impact as, as a freshman, just so, you know, people can have an idea of like, okay, look at the class of 2022. How many are going to, you know, see the field? How many are going to play? How many are going to be a high impact in that class of 2021, which is the best Oregon's ever had. You had about 10 guys who saw the field fairly regularly and or contributed in a major way. On offense, those guys, Troy Franklin, wide receiver, Dante Thornton, wide receiver, came on a little bit more at the end of the season, but he did have a big catch for a touchdown in the Stony Brook game, and, and we saw the potential there in the Alamo Bowl, most, most notably. He did have a couple other catches throughout the year, but you know Franklin certainly had the more productive freshman campaign between the two of them, but I, I love the potential of both. I think Thornton is a true Z receiver who you uh, want to take some deep shots to. He's got uh, long legs at 6'5" great speed and you know is just a, a deep threat and Franklin can certainly beat you over the top has that sort of speed and, and length as well he's just about 6162 the skinnies as we call them but I, I think Franklin is just lethal in like the 7 to 15 yard route range I, I think that's where he could really really thrive and you can line him up outside or in the slot as well but they were both fresh and seven McGee had a bunch of big time plays and I mean we were all on him to get the ball even more and he did as the season went on like he became the new Jalen Red after Jalen Red got hurt so that was maybe part of the reason we saw him more but I think you were going to be hard pressed even with Jalen Red on the roster to keep him off the field not get him touches we saw it in the UCLA game when he had a couple nice runs he had a couple jet sweeps against Oregon State against Utah in the Pac-12 championship championship game as well. Every time he was getting the ball in space, good things were happening and involving him in the return game is just something I'm always, always forever and always going to be in favor of. You had Maliki Matavau as well, tight end. He played a lot, caught a touchdown against Ohio State. Man, that's his second college football game ever. And he was able to make that play. And he's a big time blocker. Speaking of tight ends, Terrence Ferguson, who I think of uh, Oregon's talented tight end group, might be the best of the bunch. His explosive speed down the side, I will not be surprised at all if he's an NFL draft pick after three years with the Ducks. He's got two left. Byron Cardwell had to step in after uh, C.J. Riddell went down with an injury defensively and partially offensively as well. You had Jackson Powers Johnson, and then strictly on the defensive side of the ball, you had Keith Brown, the linebacker. Avante Dickerson saw saw the field here and there. Not not a ton, but, I mean, it wasn't a surprise to see him out there. I believe he was wearing number 28 a season ago. Jeffrey Basso came on strong late but was playing basically the whole season. I understand that that was the highest rated recruiting class in school history, but I think that Dan Lanning and this staff can get to that sort of level or at least be close to it. Close to it. And so when you think about, you know, guys transferring during the season or uh, injuries that can come up as well, that's 10 guys who saw the field regularly. So I, I, I bring that up and go through those players to point out that, yeah, part of recruiting is playing the long game and having a, a foundation on the roster. And, you know, when the offensive line leaves after this season, at least four of them will, probably five, you have guys waiting in the wings like a, a Jonah Miller or a Bram Walden in the class of 2021 who were pretty highly rated offensive line recruits who haven't seen the field at all because they're waiting in the wings behind guys like Ryan Walk, TJ uh, uh, T.J. Bass, Alex Forsyth, Big Sala, Stephen Jones, who's, uh, you know, that probably projects his Oregon's offensive line this year. And, you know, the other thing about that class 2021 is you had all those high impact players, but then uh, some guys are 
not able to see the field a ton as a freshman, but it doesn't mean they can't become that, right? Players like Ty Thompson, uh, you know, Bram Walden, who who I mentioned with Jonah Miller, Isaiah Bravar was a four-star wide receiver. Maybe he emerges as a potential slot guy, but now it's definitely a lot tougher with Chris Hudson and Seven McGee there. I think Brevard uh, might actually be a transfer candidate here after after the season, depending on how it goes. Damon David talked about him recently because he's coming back to Oregon. So there, there's always a mixture in every recruiting class, right? Some guys are able to come in and, you know, be major contributors right away. I mean, Ferguson, Montevallo were on the field constantly, right? We were rotating tight ends just in and out all season long with uh, with Spencer Webb in that group as well. And Franklin was, was out there uh, quite a bit, making plays all over the field. So it can do a lot. It, it, it can help change your program pretty quickly, but part of it is also about, you know, bringing in guys who are not going to play right now, but will in the future and will eventually become great players. Closing today with a bit of a fun segment. Again, another question. This one came via my uh, my Twitter direct messages from uh, Duck Demon, who's a regular question ask, asker here on the show, and I appreciate him weighing in again. Uh, this one a little bit uh, a little bit on, on the lighter side or whatnot, and he was asking about uh, you know interesting and weird jobs of uh, past Oregon football players. Now this is a tough thing to find. Like I was you know looking up guys' names, trying to find LinkedIn's or trying to find Twitters, and not every every guy's on social media. But I did find some names that I thought were uh, pretty interesting, and, and these are jobs of past Oregon football players who are not in football or who are not playing football, I should say, right? Because somebody like Tony Washington Jr., for example, is currently Oregon's director of player development. Uh, I think the, the the biggest one here that we all know about is LaMichael James owns two killer burgers in uh, Oregon. One of them is in Beaverton and one of them is in Cruz Village in Lake Oswego, literally 30 seconds from where I grew up. I wish Cruz Village, it didn't show up until I was like 18 17, 18 or so, I wish it had been there my whole life. I would have gone there co- constantly, um, if not only just to see LaMichael at a, at a Killer Burger, perhaps. But if I'm ever rolling back through, maybe we'll have to hop over, see if uh, Oregon's best running back of all time is in the house. But, you know, it, it's fascinating to see where some of these guys go. Um, it, it started, and I give Duck Demon credit for this one, and I you know looked up the other ones, but uh, Devin Chandler who is not a name that I was super familiar with and uh, maybe some Oregon fans out there are. It's not a, a big time name uh, in terms of the lore and history of Oregon football, but uh, Devin Chandler Long is his name and he's acting in CBS, uh, the CBS show Ghosts. He was also in the Ambulance movie, the Michael Bay film with Jake Gyllenhaal and I don't remember who else was in it. Um, I, I haven't seen it, but one that was uh, certainly... Might watch, might might watch it in the coming weeks. Frankly, now that I know that that he's in there, it also look pretty. It also looked pretty good, and I, I like Michael Bay. He did Transformers, and those are fun films. Uh, I watched those all the time when I, when I was a kid. Uh, another one that's worthy of note: Jeff Mail, my favorite receiver in Oregon football history. I wish I could clone Jeff Mail ten times. I wish every receiver was just Jeff Mail. Just that general general rule of thumb. I love Troy Franklin. I I, I really like Dante Thornton. I like Seven McGee and Chris Hudson. I wish they were all Jeff Mail. Um, all of them. I loved watching that guy play football, but he is, uh, an inside sales rep for Mason's, uh, lumber supply, Mason's supply. They do like a uh, construction supply stuff. But another thing that you might not have known, he's, uh, also been coaching E forces seven on seven for, for the last three years. And I think that's a really neat ass, neat, neat thing to do. If you're a former football player, like, yeah, you have to find a job that pays the bills, but wanting to stay close to and around the game. He gave it a go in the NFL, got on chips roster with the Eagles at one point, but wasn't able to make it, but still uh, staying around the game. That's good. But this is, uh, this is definitely the best one that, that I was able to track down. And if you know of any others, drop them in the YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter. I would love to share it here on the show. Cause it's part of the great part about college sports, seeing where, you know, where guys end up and where, where they where they go in life. Derek Malone Jr., a rock solid linebacker for Oregon back in the day. He's done work on, on Netflix teams and doing some stuff behind the scenes there, but he wrote a children's book. You can go check him out on, on Twitter. He still uh, reps Oregon in his bio, and uh, he wrote a children's book. That is, I wouldn't have the faintest idea of where to start 
to write a children's book. And I think that is, is an awesome thing to do. Uh, so those are just some, uh, some, some fun, interesting, uh, notable jobs of past Oregon football players. If you got any, by all means, uh, drop them in the comments below. Thank you all for listening. I will see you next time and have a, have a wonderful rest of your day and go ducks.